Well, throughout um, the uh, Advent season and then into the first of the year in the Easter season, we spent an awful lot of time in the New Testament. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to balance all this up here on this little thing. We spent a lot of time in the New Testament, and so this summer I thought we would step back into the Old Testament. We're going old school on you. And a lot of my favorite stories in the Bible come from the Old Testament. And so these are some of my favorites. Over the next few weeks, we're going to explore Abraham and David and Gideon. Maybe a couple you don't know, Mephibosheth and a couple of others. And then Susan's going to bless us with, uh, with one of her favorites as well. But I hope you'll be able to make it to at least a majority of them so you can get a little bit of flavor of the Old Testament throughout the summer question for you guys as we begin. How many of you all are planners? Planners? How many of you just fly by the seat of your pants? How many of you are list makers? List makers? How many of you just lose the list anyway or forget to look at it so you don't even bother making one anymore? Huh? Do we have engineers or architects, IT people, systems analyst people, any of those out there? Those are people that details matter, right? And they look at the details. Most of us, though, regardless of our profession, our vocation, or our training, or our personality type, we like somewhat order. Somewhat. Some more than others. Some of you, I know, make lists to keep up with your list, right? You make lists of lists. In today's world, if someone were to take away our iPhones or our, our smartphones or our iPads or our computer, many of us would be totally disoriented, wouldn't we? My calendar. My calendar is on my, my smartphone, on my iPad, on my, it's in three or four different places. It's on my computer. I would be lost without it. I don't know when my appointments are. I've got this neat little app that it pops up and tells me whenever I have an appointment. I get an email every morning that says, Chris, here's what you have planned for the day. It makes a list for me. We schedule planning meetings to develop a plan of action, and then, then what do we do? We implement the plan, right? We do that in church. We do that in business. And next we schedule what? We schedule follow-up meetings to get and give updates on these plans, right? How's it coming along? And then we rework the plan if necessary, right? But don't deviate from our plans because it, we planned it after all. Now, some of that is much needed. Some of that is, is overkill just because we like to know where we're at and where we're going. Your finance team over a year ago began looking at ways that, that we could reduce our debt. As I got here, it was clear to me that, that the mortgage was a millstone around our neck. It was choking us. And so we began to say, what can we do? We just didn't throw it haphazardly together. And so we began to make a plan. And so we, we refinanced the, the mortgage, knocked 2% off, which is a lot of money on a million dollars which was the first part of the plan. And then we decided that after we refinanced that we would make biweekly payments of $5,500 rather than a monthly payment. You see, by doing that, we knock off the daily interest and more money goes toward the principal. And then also, we make two extra payments throughout the year. Lastly, we opened up a savings account, trusting that, that you all would continue to give generously and faithfully to help pay this off. And we actually earn interest on part of our money because through the United Methodist Foundation, capital money or money that is in a building fund to be used for a building or debt reduction earns interest. Not a lot, but at least we earn something. And over the last year, God has blessed our planning and our frugality, and we've cut over $200,000 off of our mortgage in less than a year. Yeah, amen. Now, you could say, is that because of a good plan? Is that because of faithful giving? Is that because of the blessing of God? And the answer would be yes to all of that. And by the end of the year, we expect 
that we're going to be well below $800,000. And that millstone around our neck is getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And as we give faithfully and generously toward that debt, we are watching it literally sink. God is blessing that. We're also beginning the, the stages to develop a vision, if you will, of what hillside will grow into. We know what we've been, but we want to know what we'll grow into. And make no mistake, we are growing. It's summer, people are taking vacations, all of that. But if you notice, typically on a Sunday morning at this first service, we've got 10 or 12 kids on a good Sunday for this first service. And at the second one, we've got as many as 30 or 35 kids. And a lot of them are new families that are coming that you are bringing to our church. And as we develop this vision, we're going to share it with you. You're going to give us input as to, to who are we becoming and who do we want to be and what is God calling us to be. And then we'll develop a plan, because that would be prudent, on how to get there. Because you guys don't want to sign on to a half-hearted vision, do you? Let's just come. How about this? Let's just come and sit in our pews every week and give a little bit of money and keep the doors open and the lights on and pat ourselves on the back. That's not the kind of vision that we want to sign up for. You want to know where we're going and how we're going to get there. Last scenario here for you. Ever take a trip, a long trip with no itinerary? Anyone? I have to share this with you. A few years ago, I was going through a divorce. It's been 10 or 11 years ago. And I have this wonderful friend. That's, he's a really good businessman. He's made some horrible investments, but he's made many that have really paid off. And a long time ago, he invested a lot into this thing called the World Wide Web in his business before it was fashionable. And he was very profitable and he succeeded a lot. And as I was going through this time in my life that I was very weary, he, he calls me up and he says, hey, if I send you a plane ticket to Mexico, will you go with me? I'm making the same offer to another friend of ours. He's been through the ringer lately. And I'd like for the three of us to take a trip together. I said, sure, absolutely, what a gift. So he gave me the dates, he booked the flight, sent me the flight number, no itinerary, no contact information for the hotel where we would be staying, in Mexico, no sightseeing tours, nothing. But knowing him, I wasn't surprised. And so about a week before the trip, I called him up and I said, so what's the plan? His response was, I've rented a Jeep. Okay, that's it? Yep, I've rented a Jeep for the week. Where are we staying? Don't know. We'll all arrive in Cancun in the airport with about an hour of each other. We'll pick up the Jeep, and then I thought we'd drive south. Maybe we'll go as far as Belize. Don't know what we're going to do. Best trip of my life. I took off my watch when I got there, and I just enjoyed the ride. Now, I've known this guy for 35 years now, maybe longer. As I get older, it gets longer. I've taken numerous trips with him. I lived with him for two years, and I have complete trust in him, blind trust, because he's proven himself trustworthy to me, and I have more faith in him than I do in any plans that he would make because I know him, and he wouldn't make plans. Now, there's only one way that most of us would agree to proceed not knowing the plan or at least part of the plan. We'd need to have a great deal of faith in the person in charge, right? We would need a history with this person in charge of positive outcomes because our faith then would be in what? It would be in the leader or the person we're following and not in the plan. In selected verses from... Hebrews that, that Sue read for us today, we discover that, that faith is being sh sure of what we hope for. It's certain of what we do not see. Something we can't touch. We've got faith in something. And we learn that by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and he went. Even though he didn't know what? He didn't know where he was going. And by faith, even though he was past the age and Sarah was past age herself of being able to bear children, they became parents. 
There was a child of a promise because God had made a promise. And then by faith, when Abraham was tested, he offered up Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham trusted in the God who called him and not in the plan. Because let's be honest, he didn't know the plan. God hadn't given it to him. The story begins in chapter 12 in Genesis, and I want to want to trek through this story quickly. We're going to do it in about 10 minutes. The story of Abraham. You may know some of these details. You may not know some of them. Hopefully you'll learn something new. But in chapter 12, if you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn there. It says, The Lord said from a- to Abram, Abram, notice it's not Abraham. I want you to go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. Verse 2, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Throughout that, those few verses, God says, I will, I will, I will. And so we find out that God's plan to make a great nation consists of a 75-year-old man and a 65-year-old woman with no children. This will be the nation. Seems absurd. So what was Abram's response? His name is Abram, not Abraham. His response, verse 4, it says, So Abram left. As God told him, he started walking. He collected up a few things, his wife, his nephew, and a few servants, and he headed out to Canaan. And the Lord appeared to Abram, and he said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord there. He started walking. To your offspring, Abram and Sarai... Her name's not Sarah yet. Sarai, have no children. So may I present to you the entire Hebrew nation. There's an old man walking, perhaps leading a donkey with an old woman sitting on it, a few raggedy servants, no livestock, no anything else. Lot, and we know he has issues if you know the story of Lot. And they, this is the entire Hebrew nation. Great plan, God, right? You see, in the ancient world, you would take your value or your worth from what? Your land, your children, your livestock, your crops. And this great nation that God had promised Abram had none of these things. Abram left his father's household. His father's name was Terah. The man was identified with his father's household. And when the the patriarch passed away, the next of kin or the heir would take it over. The son, Abram, stood to inherit his father's entire household, but he left. So by leaving, he was giving up his inheritance, his right to family property. He gave up his place in his father's household. He forfeited his security. He was putting his survival, his identity, his future, and his security in the hands of a God that he really didn't know at this point. That's blind faith. And by making a break with his land and his family and his inheritance, Abram is also breaking all religious ties. Because you see, in those days, 2,000 years before Christ... Your deities were associated with the geographical, the political, and the ethnic divisions in which the world had been divided into. And in this new land, Abram would have no territorial gods. And as a new people, he would have brought no family gods with him. Who filled this void? A god we know as Yahweh. He had not yet revealed his name to him. And he became the god who is throughout this Bible as known as what? The god of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob kind of important to our Christian faith this story so after Abram gets to this new land the land that God will show him we're told in Genesis that there's this great famine wonderful start to a so-called plan old man old woman no land no crops they get where they're going and there's a famine so they decide that they will travel to Egypt 
But Abram was afraid because Sarai, even though she was an old woman, she was very beautiful, and he thought, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? They're going to kill me for my wife. So he told him he was her sister, and there's a whole other story about that, okay? We won't go into that. But even though Abram was a coward, and even though he lied and, and misled individuals, God blessed him. And he came back to the land after the famine with gold and silver and livestock and servants. So now he comes back to the land that God would show him, and God's going to give it to him, right? There's a problem. There's not enough land for his nephew Lot and him. So if you know the story, Abram offers Lot his choice of the land. Well, an honorable man knows that the elder had a right to the prime piece of property. But we know that Lot's not an honorable man. And so he took the cities and the plains and he gave Abram the hills. There's this whole uh, problem with Sodom and Gomorrah, which would have been the land that Lot chose. But God remains faithful to Abram, even though at this point he's getting a little bit frustrated. And in chapter 13, verses 14 through 17, the Lord said to Abram after Lot parted from him, Lift up your eyes from where you are. Look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. So that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go and walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram built an altar to the Lord. Yet at this point, Abram doesn't have any children. Sarai is barren, and what's the plan? We don't really have one. Because God hasn't revealed it to him yet. Abram, growing impatient... He's growing impatient. It's been a number of years. God appears to him again in chapter 15. And he says, don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield and a very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me? I remain childless. And the one who will inherit my my estate is Eliezer of Damascus, his servant. You, God, have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. He's getting frustrated. Then the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. And he took him outside. At this point he said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if you indeed you can count them. And then he said to Abram, So shall your offspring be. And it says that Abram believed the Lord. And counted it as righteousness. But Sarai is beginning to grow impatient also. Because God has promised them that they will be a great nation. So she has this big idea that perhaps this chosen heir, this start of this great nation, will not come from her. It will be Abram's child, but perhaps not hers. So she offers her maidservant servant, Hagar, to Abram. This was common practice in these days, because remember, lots of children met many hands for lots of work, okay? And they were nomads, and they were people that, that worked the land. And Abram, of course, he looked, and he didn't argue with her. And they have a child called Ishmael. And God says, he's not the chosen one. I made a promise to you, Abram. I made a promise to you. Abram's 86 at this point. It's been 11 years. He's growing weary and tired. 13 years later, we're told in chapter 17 that God appears to Abram when he's 99 years old. And he says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Verse 2 in chapter 17 says, I will confirm my covenant between me and you, and I will greatly increase your numbers. 99-year-old man, no kids. Abram fell face down. Abram coincidentally means father. Yet he had no children. 
Sarai means princess, yet she had no kingdom. He said, this is my covenant with you. You'll be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, which means father of many, yet he has no children. I have made you the father of many nations. Not I will make, I have already made you. I will make you very fruitful and I will make nations of you. Kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants for the generations to come. I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you're now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants forever. And then God said to Abraham, You must keep my covenant and your descendants after you in generations to come. This is my covenant. Not so thrilled with the covenant. God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. Then he tells him something about Sarai. Almost 90 years old, he says, As for Sarai, you're no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah, which means queen. Queen of a nation that does not yet exist. I will bless her and I will give you a son. So that she will become the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. And Abram fell, Abraham fell face down and he laughed. And he said to God, will a, man, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? And will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? God said, yes, Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac which Isaac coincidentally means laughter because Sarah and Abraham both laughed that a 90-year-old and a 100-year-old would have a son. But they did. Isaac is born. He is circumcised on the eighth day as prescribed by the law. And so now I present to you the Hebrew nation, the start of Judaism, our Christian faith. It is a 100-year-old nomad, desert rat, and a 90-year-old woman and one child. And this is the great nation of Israel. And then God asked Abraham to do the unthinkable. And do what? Give back his only begotten son. His only beloved son to God. And he says, do what? Sacrifice him. But I want you to do this on the hills of Mount Moriah, which... We know that they're located just outside of Jerusalem. And I want you to sacrifice this child. And so Abram obeys and he gets up there and God provides a ram instead of Isaac and says, since you were faithful, I will again renew my covenant with you that all nations on earth will be blessed through you and through this child. Sarah died when she was 127, and Abraham died at the age of 175. A hundred years from the time God made the first promise. We know that from the line of Abraham, God would send what? A Savior. Jesus Christ, who would bless the entire world and would save the entire world, not just the Hebrew people, from their sins and would be the supreme sacrifice that would restore us into right relationship with God. Ever wonder if the Old Testament is about Jesus Christ? And the answer is, God made the promise to Abraham repeatedly, I will bless the entire world through you. And he was talking about Jesus. All along, that was the plan. So what did Abram do when God called him to go to a place that he would show him? He started walking. And he began to have faith in the one who had made the promise, not in the plan, because let's face it, he didn't have a plan. What is the plan? Well, the plan all along was Jesus Christ. And we are an extension of that plan. We are, ever seen Father Abraham in Bible school? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had five. I'm one of them and so are you. Know that? That's why we sing that song. 
I am one of them. By extension, we are children of God. We are children of the promise. God always finishes what he starts, but he needs us to do our part at this point. Because the plan at this point is the church. You and I. And we're called to be a light unto our world. And he has put us on a hill. And we're called to trust in the one who made the promise even now 4,000 years ago to a man called Abram who when God called him to go to a place that he would show him, he started walking. And sometimes when we don't know where we're going and we don't have a picture of what we'll be and we don't know the steps that come after steps one and two, we are still called to start walking. Amen.